I know, right? It's, it's, it'll be okay, you know? Whatever. All right, so first we can talk about the, the Michelson-Morley experiment. Okay, so basically what they were trying to prove is that back in, uh, okay, so prior to 1900, the, the laws of electrodynamics were determined. They were, they're Maxwell's equations, they were found to be true, yada, yada, yada. Now, what was predicted from Maxwell's equations are that the speed of light was constant, no matter what. It is. It is a number. It is 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Okay. There it is. There's no. There's no changing it or anything like that. Assuming it's traveling in a vacuum. Now, what we didn't know was what space was made out of, out above us, you know, outer space. Now, obviously, we had never been there. It was 1900. Now, so several scientists popped postulated that it was filled with something called the ether, the luminiferous ether. It really doesn't matter what it's called because it's not true. But basically, their experiment was trying to find what, what the shift of light should have been since it was traveling in this medium. They found that it didn't have any effect. They thought it was a total failure. Their, their experiment was wrong. Obviously, they, they had a horrible setup. Unfortunately, they're actually, well, fortunately for us, but unfortunately for them, uh, they were right. Not, not, not to say that there isn't an ether. There isn't. But if there is one, the Earth is traveling at the exact same speed as the ether. That's kind of what we say in science. You can never say something doesn't exist. We can just say we're moving such that it appears as though it doesn't exist. Okay? So basically, oh man, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pull a kill way on anybody. <laughs> Give me your phone. I got a funny story about Dr. Kilwain that I'll tell you some other time. But um, yeah, so basically what they found, as, as I mentioned before, are these pseudo forces, okay? And basically what they are is they are a result of the, of the frame accelerating. So let's say I had a giant spaceship and we were going really, really fast and we took a, you know, we took a turn. You would experience some movement opposite to the direction of the turn. That's not real. I mean, yeah, it's real. You moved. But it's not a real force. And those are a result of the fact that the, that the spaceship is accelerating. Now, this sort of stuff isn't really so crucial for you to understand. The big takeaway from, from this message in this experiment is that things are different when we start moving towards the speed of light. Okay. That's, that's the real big take-home message. Time is different. Length can be different. Mass can be different. But we're only going to talk about the first two of those. All right. So when Einstein was formulating his uh, theory of special relativity, yes, yes. You know, that, that actually gets into, that's, that's exactly what, what we were talking about, is that it all depends on your frame of reference. The person that's in the spaceship, I mean, they don't, they don't perceive anything to be happening. But an observer outside watching the spaceship would find that the spaceship was getting smaller, length, length contraction. 
So that's the, re that's the real take, is that's the take home message, is that depending upon where you are, like if you're in the object that's moving, or if I'm watching from an outside position, we will see different things. That's actually a really good question because uh, it goes, this goes in right to this first, this first postulate. Does everybody know what a postulate is? All right, yeah. Oh, is it? That's kind of gross. Uh, so um, a postulate are things that are assumed to be true. Okay, so when Einstein was getting ready to work all this stuff out, you can't just start from nothing, you know. You have to basically assume certain things are true and then start working to find what the results are. Okay, so this was one of the, uh, one of the postulates, is that the laws of mechanics are the same in all inertial reference frames. So that means that that person, let, let's say that they were moving at a constant velocity now, not, not accelerating, but moving at a constant velocity, but really close to the speed of light, all right? And then you got somebody hanging out on Mars or whatever watching them. What this postulate says is that, I mean, while they may see different things, the law, I mean, the laws of mechanics have to be the same. They have to be, right? I mean, you can't have something weird going on, you know, in the spaceship and not. Anybody? All right. Yeah, okay. And so here's, here's kind of a, a thought experiment that, that they were using. So this one would be the observer, right, in a, in a rest frame. And this guy's hanging out on a truck, right? That's a nice truck. Anybody? Do you? Okay. <laughs> Ford. <laughs> yeah, all right. So basically, so this is, so let, let's not look at this one. Let's look at this one first. So they're throwing a ball. So this person here in the truck does a little, just throw, throws the ball forward. He would see that the ball is moving at the speed that he threw it at, right? He's in the truck. I threw the ball, you know? That's, that's just the way it is. This person right here would see that the ball was moving at the speed that he threw it in plus the speed that the truck was moving at. And this is good. This is all well and good. This is what mechanics would say happens. Now there become, there's a little bit of a problem. What if instead of a ball, he was flashing a flashlight? He was turning on a flashlight, okay? The person in the truck turns on the flashlight, you would see it would go at the speed of light, right? But then the person on the ground would see that it was going at the speed of light plus the speed of the truck. There's a problem with that. Does anybody know what the problem is? Yeah, it'd be going faster than the speed of light. You should be, you should be going in your head, say what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Say what? Okay, so this, is, uh, so this is what prompted the belief that the, the speed of light, I mean, as, as a result. I mean, so here, that's a little relative I had a problem. It could not be true, okay? Everyone all right with this? Okay, now does everybody know that the, the speed of light, this is just a little side note for you, the speed of light is just is not just some number that like they, they conjured up. Like it's actually one over the square root of epsilon naught mu naught, like the permittivity of free space and the, you guys remember those permeability? Yeah, it's pretty nice, right? Well, that's unfortunate for you. Okay. Okay, and then this, this moved on into the fact that there was, there was no obvious medium for light waves to work in, first of all, because we hadn't been in space, and the fact that they couldn't find that there was an ether, the Michelson-Morley experiment. There, there wasn't one, according to their experiment. So what are we going to do? What are you going to do? All right, these are the things that uh, really prompted Einstein right here. And really, it was determined that, I mean, the speed of light had been calculated by various, you know, methods. And it was done based on, like, the light coming from the sun to the planet. 
So this wasn't some experiment that was done here on Earth that, oh, okay, it was done on Earth. Maybe there's a problem. It's different in space. No. It was done in space. So the speed of light was the speed of light. That's not where the problem was. The problem was in our interpretation of the physical events. So... How long does uh, Bob usually go, just out of curiosity? Really? 2.30. He's already, he would already been done. He's done. What are you? Okay. Well, we kind of already talked about that. So. Their experiment verified that no matter what the direction light was traveling, it had the same speed. And it was moving in, a, in the same direction as the luminiferous ether, ether. All right, so here are the two postulates that Einstein used to create the theory of special relativity. All the, law, all the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames, and the speed of light is constant. I don't know if Bob puts questions like that on a test, but you guys don't get like true-false questions or something like that? Well, that's nice. <sighs> well, those are important. Learn them. Live them. Physics. Okay. Okay, so this is really just a um, just a representation. Actually, to be honest with you, I don't know why that slide's in there. It really doesn't make any sense. Okay, so this is um, actually we can use the picture on this one. Okay, so basically, what you guys are going to start doing with these problems that you're going to do with uh, length, contraction, and time dilation is you're going to start to see the difference between this person and the person in the rest frame. So, and this is denoted with an O, and then the person experiencing the uh, motion close to the speed of light is O prime. I don't know if you can really see that, but there it is. Okay. Oh, also, does uh, Professor Riggs ever do any like math on the board? <laughs> okay. Good to know. Okay. Okay, so then here's the um here here's one of the things that, that we were talking about. All right. So the simultaneity of certain events. Let's say you were sitting here. Wow, that really sucks. There we go. Oh yeah. It's a little it's a little pixelated. <laughs> just just a little bit. All right, so what these are, is these are like candles, maybe. Could be a light. I, I really don't know. That's a battery. I'm sure you all know from your circuits. Yeah, yeah. All right, so if this thing isn't moving, that's a person. All right, let's say I flipped a switch so that those two lights came on right at the same time. Okay? What would happen is they, they would be simultaneous to that person, right? The, the same distance apart, you would see the light hit you at the same time. Now, the problem comes in is that when you start moving fast, I mean not fast, but close to the speed of light, it's not true anymore. And basically what happens if we're moving in that direction, the light from the candle in the direction that you're moving is going to reach you before the other light is, assuming that you're a comparable distance from both of them. I mean, obviously, if the two lights are just right here, then there's not going to be much of a difference. But this is, and so these little thought experiments, and these are mathematical results of uh, good old Einstein. No. No, no, no. You're moving at a speed that is close to the speed of light, which typically means, like, it would be represented like 0.3c. C is the symbol for the speed of light, or you can 0 0.6, 0 0.9, but you would, comparable, not like five miles an hour. 
we're, mo we're, we're moving a little bit faster. All right. Now we're going to get into, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Time dilation. So, oops. So, here's, here, here's the experiment that they set up. So let's say I had a light, and this is a mirror. And so I kept uh, what's well probably more like, let's say it was a photon shooter, the photon gun. Be careful. The photon gun. And it's shooting of photons, and they're coming back. They're just coming back and forth like this. That's fine, right? You guys don't have any problem with that. And they would go at the speed of light. Now, what would have happened, though, if we it started accelerating? Let's say we were in a, in a train car that just just took off. This person right here is in the rest frame, so they're going to find, they're just going to see the same thing as, as this original setting did. They're just going to move the time it takes for these particles to come here and back. It's just the same. But when this person starts observing it, because you're moving close to the speed of light, you'll see that what happened is this is the path that the object had to take, the photon, the electron, the ball, whatever. So that can't possibly be the same amount of time. Would you guys like to see how they figured out how much time it was? Oh, man, you got outvoted. <laughs> oh, yeah. And what's, what's nice enough about it is they only needed to know the Pythagorean theorem to do this. Does everybody know what the Pythagorean theorem is? You're having too much fun. <laughs> there, we don't we don't take kindly to that sort of stuff. All right, so here's this. Oh, we might not. We might not have to. Oh, there we go. All right, so let's see a distance d, and we all know that. Um, Velocity is the distance traveled divided by the amount of time, right? And let's say that this object was moving at the speed of light, which means that this distance would be, the distance would be V times T, but for us, our velocity is the speed of light, okay? Now, that's just for it to go here, you know, there and back. So what we need to do is we're going to go ahead and divide that by 2, because that would be the amount of time it would take to get to one of them. All right, so that's for the one setup. Now for this other one, that's kind of what we got going there. Don't make fun of my drawings. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So this is what we have here. That's a, sorry about that. That's C, T divided by two. All right, so Pythagorean theorem, theorem, a squared plus whoop, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So we have vt over two squared plus b squared equals just like that. All right, and this v down here is the speed at which our reference frame is moving. Yes. This CT divided by 2, and that's VT divided by 2. Okay? All right. Now, when we're talking about time dilation, we need to set a proper time. Okay? This is the time that is going to be assumed to be true for us. And the easiest way to do that is to just pick the reference frame that's not moving. Right? So that we're going to define this time right here. Oh, I didn't leave enough space for it. That's all right. So the time, the proper time, is going to be 2 times the distance divided by c. All right. So now, how, 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 much, how much do you guys like to see algebra? 
on a 1 to 10 scale? Okay. So basically, we're going to solve this equation for time. Is everyone okay with that? If I just do a little dot, 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 time. Okay. All right, so what, so what you would find is that t is going to equal 2 times that distance divided by the square root c minus v squared. Like that, okay? Then I'm going to do a little bit more algebra. All right? So this is going to be what we got. Now you'll notice that this right here is the proper time right there. So our t, the time dilation, is going to be the proper time. And then we have 1 over this. And we're just going to call that gamma. So when you guys are doing problems with time dilation, that's the equation you're going to need to use. Now, you'll also, you also might want to look at this and see, well, what would happen if, if our velocity was small? What if, what it do, does this work for us here on, on Earth, rolling a ball? Well, yeah, if the velocity is small, then really a really small number divided by a really big number might as well be zero. Right? What's, well, what's one divided by a trillion? Might as well be zero. So this would reduce to just the proper time. All right? So this equation is actually valid if we're moving fast or if we're moving slow. If we're moving slow, it just reduces down to the Newtonian case. All right? All right. Now, this can help you explain the fact that um, time travel is possible. You like that? Yeah. It's nice. But only that's true. You cannot travel into the past. You can only travel into the future. But it's not, but it's not really traveling into the future. Well, we can talk about that for a second. So basically, what time dilation says is that the faster you are moving, towards the speed of light, the slower time will move for you. Okay? So I, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the twin paradox. It's one of Einstein's most famous thought experiments. But let's say there was a guy here on Earth and his twin brother. His twin brother worked for NASA, whatever. doesn't matter. He got into a spaceship, and he flew really close to the speed of light. <laughs> Sounds just like that. <laughs> Except for it doesn't. You know why? There's no sound in space. Yeah, Star Trek doesn't know what they're talking about. But um, <laughs> all right. So then he goes, he flies out really close to the speed of light, and then he comes back. And time here on Earth would have passed in a in a much greater value than time for him. So in a sense, he has traveled into the future. It's not that time stopped for the guy in the spaceship. It just moved very, very slow compared to what people here on Earth were experiencing. So if you want to travel into the future, start working on a machine that can make you go close to the speed of light. Well, you know. All right, so then right here, there's the, uh, the expression that, I, that we found right there. This would be the proper time. And then here's that a little bit more algebraically simplified. OK? So we'll do length contraction, and then that'll be it for today. Does anybody have any questions about time dilation? Yes? Well, that's an interesting question. One to which that 